Alfred, great to spend some time with you. I always enjoy our chats. And, you know, I, I think we were just talking about this. I was talking recently with a colleague and they were asking me, like, you know, I'm just one person in a, in a large organization. How can one person impact company culture? And, you know, coming into our conversation today, I was thinking about you, about that, because I always see you pop up. You're very active in different groups within Microsoft. Um, you, I always see you on social and I think you and I are both examples of folks that have, you know, while we're one person, we've been able to create uh, different synergies and conversations with a lot of different people within this organization. So I'd love to get your thoughts. How does one person impact company culture? No, it's a great question. And thanks for having me here, Carson. Honestly, for me, when I think about the impact that we make, it's about one, staying engaged, right? There's, there's something out there for everyone to do. And there's a lot of opportunities where we can actually make that impact. You know, one thing I've learned at Microsoft is you can wait for somebody to do it or you can do it yourself. You can take the bull by its horns and make a difference. So there are a lot of ideas, concepts that people are always constantly bringing up and throwing out there. And the question you have to ask yourself is what are you willing to do? What are you willing to challenge your peers to do? Right? And then that once you go from there, you take on that leadership role of this is something I wanna see happen or change or build what i've learned to do through over that time is just believe in the idea and nurture the idea a great example is if i want to do something around uh, uh training a, a, a subset of people you know i can wait for someone to do it or i can take the bull by the horns and say okay we're going to you know educate you on the microsoft hardware because it's important for your career because it's important it's going to make an impact to the business so that's been it for me. It's really not waiting for someone to tell you what to do, but identifying what you're passionate about, identifying what you're good at doing, and putting your best into it. Everybody comes to the table with, you know, kind of their own unique skill set, talent, way of doing things. And I think you nailed it because a lot of folks, look, you're, the, the way that you perform versus your project milestones or your uh, performance metrics, that's table stakes, right? I mean, you, you can stretch beyond that. And we're fortunate because we work for an organization that I think fosters a lot of that collaboration and stretching and going beyond your role. Even if you work for a very small organization, you know, I worked for small companies in my day, and uh, a lot of times they will give you that autonomy as well and that ability to um, make changes very rapidly. So I think the key element is, like you said, you've got to identify, okay, what am I good at? What am I strong at? What am I passionate about? And how do I replicate that beyond just my role? How do I get other people in the boat with me? How do I seek out some of the people that are doing what I'm doing or want to be doing and then learn from them, share best practices? I've always tried to go out and try to figure out who's better than I am at something. And then, because then I can learn from them, I can make that part of my arsenal and iron sharpens iron. It makes us all better. Um, and I think that's the beauty of, you know, this digital age is, anybody is at your fingertips. There's no mm -hmm. geographical barriers. You know, you can go out on LinkedIn and you can find people that are very strong or proficient in these areas and learn from them. And you change company culture by engaging people and by understanding what motivates them, what makes them tick, understanding the value that you can bring to them and investing in that selflessly. You know, I don't personally care when I have conversations with others if I learn a darn thing. I know that I will, but it isn't about that. It's where can I maybe make a difference or help somebody um, and that it reciprocates because these are the types of things when you make investments and deposits and relationships, they pay dividends because you will be you'll make a relationship that could last for the rest of your career. What better reward is there than that? Culture is a byproduct of that type of mentality. And I think the more we have that mentality, uh, the better. Yeah. Um, I mean, just just to your point, right? The way I think about it is stop waiting for someone to tell you that you're good enough. Stop waiting for someone to tell you how to figure out how to do something. If you want to see it done, ask yourself what it is, why you want to do it, and go after it, right? Because those ideas are going to sit there and wait for you to actually implement it, or you're going to want somebody else to do it, right? You know, the, the way I work and I think about this, is I feel like there's a constant race to sort of build an idea, a solution, and you have to be the engineer that says, okay, I'm going to orchestrate how I'm going to build this team, this program, this application, this solution, this sales motion, right? 
it's all based on your ability to drive that that initiative. And the the best ideas of the the best ideas are ones that you basically take off and you run with it as much as possible. And if you're not sure, be willing to step back and say, wait, somebody else did it this way. I'm going to reach out to them and ask them what they did, right? And 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 that is such a key part in, in you know why I do so much. You know I believe in those concepts because, uh, as you mentioned, iron sharpens iron. You you build a program, you deliver it, and somebody says, "Wow, how'd you do that?" And you say, "Oh, that's easy. This is how you do it." And you write it out to them and say, "Okay, it's your turn. If you need help, come back to me. I'll help you out at the at the end." That's exactly it. Because then you've in essence created a movement around that. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times like I've done something and I always try to say, like, look, I don't profess to be the end all be all around whatever this topic is. I just have a way that works for me and I'm happy to talk about it. And I'd love to keep the dialogue going. If you find some things that work or don't work, like let's come back to the table and, and continue the conversation. That's what's going to make everybody better. Now, one of the things that fascinates me, too, Alfred, from, you know, our vantage point, I think both of us have spent time in selling, but in very different capacities. You know, I've been in a lot of industry verticals in my day. I've been in telecommunications and advertising, and now um, obviously in cloud and software. I know you spent time in software, hardware, and other uh, industry type verticals. What are some of the commonalities and what are some of the very distinct nuances between uh, those different selling uh, parameters? Mm -hmm. Great question. And I'll kind of take you back by about six years ago because I was a uh... I was actually selling applications of software in the in the, you know for mobile devices. We, we call it, if you know Intune and Endpoint Manager. I was an Endpoint Manager security specialist at the time, so I had a passion for why do I why does somebody need this solution? How is it going to solve this problem? And I spent a lot of my time you know telling that story until one day I ended up going to one of our internal conferences. Uh, if everybody if anybody knows who Panos Pane is, he is the 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 window the 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 head of Windows and devices. Now, uh, when I saw him get on stage, he walked up, he had a hub sitting next to him, and he just basically just got up there and he started drawing. And he says, and you know, the language he used about the beauty of it and the ease of it and the capabilities of it, he, he literally just told a story. And I, I reached out to my manager and I said, listen, I wanna do what he does, right? So I, I jumped, I said, I want to get there. And then my manager said, you know, go ahead. That's what you, you probably want to do that. I'll let you do that. And to be honest, this is where I thought the similarities were the same because it's a product. It's a product. It's a product. So we're going to tell a product story. That's what it is. But what happened was I jumped into it way too quickly because what I realized was selling hardware was somewhat different than selling applications and software. It's a different sales motion. It's a different cycle. Uh, and what I thought I was doing was, oh, I need to show you how this thing works, but I didn't have any tangible evidence of it because I hadn't I hadn't realized that, you know, in order for someone to fall in love with hardware, they actually have to see it, feel it, understand its value. So the pitch changed because the beauty of what drove the adoption was having the physical device, the feel of it, the touch of it, being able to talk about it seeing it, being able to perform on it. Whereas an application, you just go to a website, you pull up the information, it's all there. So for me, where the, the cycle of uh, adoption changed was the ability to tell a story about something that someone can tangibly own and over time fall in love with it. It's the, it's a good example of this. And this, this is where it gets kind of complicated, right? If you have a Coke and I have a Pepsi and I give you Coke, and you're drinking a Coke, you're a Coke guy, I'm a Pepsi guy, and I say, you should try out this Pepsi. And you're like, boy, why? I like Coke, right? So my job at that point is to figure out why I think you should try out the Pepsi. But the difference is that the tangible evidence, because there's something that I'm, you know, emotionally attached to. And that's what, you know, in my world selling hardware is I have people that are in love with certain technologies, certain hardware uh, technologies, and I have to basically say, I may have something that you might enjoy better because of A, B, and C. So when you talk about hardware, everybody has one. Everybody has something, but you have to basically show them why your solution may be better in the long run. And that's a whole nother conversation, right? In the long run as to what they're using today. And there's two really powerful ways that you can do that, Alfred. I love that you said that because first off, when you go into a customer conversation, 
we have such a responsibility now because there's so much information at our fingertips and buyers are already 57% of the way down the journey before they even talk to a seller. So they have the ability to do a lot of research. And to your point, they're likely married to a solution for some very distinct reasons. I think it's key that we ask them, like, what do you like about that current solution? And we don't have the mentality of just trying to change their mind. That's not what it's about. They obviously went through a very strong due diligence to arrive at the conclusion that they arrived at. So it's not for us to try to pry that out. It's really try to understand, okay, what do you like about your solution? And then there's another element to this, the second part. And uh, I've got a friend of mine who is a, who is an author and, and you know around the sales topic and his um, Pat Tenney and his uh, book, The Bonus Round, he talks a lot about doing SWOT analysis of the competition. So you can absolutely praise and think very highly about the strength of a competitor. But your key element is where are you strong where they're not? Mm -hmm. And so to be able to say, look, absolutely, very strong at X, Y, Z. Um, I can see why you selected them. Um, I also know, you know, what's your experience been with and then insert threat here, right? Or threat or area of opportunity and then area where you're strong and be able to say like, hey, um, here's an area where I know they are not as strong and we are. We've invested you know, X, Y, Z and becoming uh, strong in this. Here's the graphs and the evidence that shows that. These are the types of things that can help you get a leg up. Um, it's key that you understand your competition. It's key that you understand why your customer gravitated toward that solution. And if you want to unravel it in any way, shape or form, you've got to make sure you articulate where you are strong and your competition is not. Well, I'm going to actually take it one step further because one of the things that I've realized being in this space for a while is perception goes a long way. Yeah. Perception goes a long way. And the reason why I say that is because if if an individual has a perception that something is better than the other, logic, it, what you just described, is something you have to spend time with them and ask them, how did you get to this point? And sometimes what you find is that you're able to break down their, their thought process and help them realize where this is where you could have saved this is where you could have improved on performance this is where you could have you know essentially taken a different route and still get gained a bit more of uh uh re, you know uh, return on investment right and and that's what i love about the software and the hardware world is because if you do it right if you if you if you marry the two together you may be able to tell a better story right so those are the similarities Right. But you have to know what those stories are in both worlds and where those two fit together. That's powerful. It's it's kind of that holistic lens. And I'll give you a couple examples. I mean, obviously, in our current world, you know, we talk to a lot of customers who may adopt a best in breed approach. Right. And there's merit to it because, you know, they're trying to pick the best solution for each individual component. But then there's also a potential platform play, which often in Microsoft, we dabble in that space, right? We have a platform, we're strong in all of the areas. We may not be the top of the uh, Gartner quadrant in every single one of them versus a competitor in one specific area, but holistically on the, you know, the, by the by, from a platform play perspective, uh, you can make that commitment. These systems integrate well. They talk to each other well. They work together well. And you know, from a savings perspective, you know, we typically can fit factor in there. Also, uh, you consolidate by working with one organization as opposed to a litany, and that's one big benefit. Um, you know, I've worked in the telecommunication space and the advertising space, and typically, while you know, you're you're trying to sell one way of doing things, uh, you try to take a multifaceted approach where you de-risk some of the other things that they are weighing. Um, you know, like even working with a uh, consumer, um, you know, we, we had people that had a some type of telephone system, wireless, you know, your internet package, your phone package, your TV package, all of these things being, uh, you know, in one shot. There's a benefit to doing that with one company as opposed to doing it with 10. Um, and I think that's the key component is helping to understand that. But I think there's a nuance here and you you hit on this a little bit, Alfred, and I'd like to spend more time on it. Talk about building relationships with customers that aren't necessarily familiar with your holistic suite of services, and maybe they have that perceived notion that you're not a player in all of them and in what matters to them. How do you build the relationship in a way that you earn trust and become a trusted advisor like you endeavor to do? And again, I, and thanks, thank you for that question. And I'm actually going to um, you know, twist a little bit because I think what you said 
really, really well, which I thought was very uh, uh, important, is the relationship is key. Like understanding what their concerns are, what what drives them, understanding their business drivers, understanding you know how, how they do their business, right? That part of that we do behind the scenes. I spend my time trying to do that research. But the truth is, the truth is, when it comes down to it, people buy from the people they trust and they they you know like if you if if my if I had a neighbor and we were really good friends and he worked for X company and I worked for Y, there's a better chance that I know that person. I'm going to actually you know, build a relationship to, to purchase from that person. So what I've learned and what I continue to practice is I have to build a relationship with the key people in the organization, the people that understand the technology, that understand the value of it. And if for some reason I am not speaking to that person, I will look for that person until we have that conversation. Because again, you know, sometimes you go and keep knocking on the door to the same person and you're not getting the response you're looking for. They're not there yet. Right. And then you may have to go to the next door and the next. Door. So for me, it's really around finding that individual that's going to be your advocate internally, building the relationship, helping them understand that your goal isn't necessarily to, hey, give them a new piece of hardware or software, but it's to build a relationship that says we're here to support you. We're here to, you know, you know, uh, partner with you. We want to make sure that you're successful in what you do so that the value that you're bringing to the organization matches the energy that they have and the needs that they have to create some sort of synergy that says we're working together. I recently met with a customer uh, in a couple of weeks ago where uh, they really didn't understand where where we stood. And I had to spend time with each each one of the key players uh, at, at, the, at the executive level, explaining to them strategies that will help them be successful, you know, re-explaining to them the importance of you know uh, the the security boundaries extending outside of the the net the the office space into the, you know the remote work. You know we we deal a lot with the COVID and, and remote patient support. In in the in that in there is a fear inherent fear that if I open up my network, threats will come in, right? But until they understand that, hey, by the way, we've done this with 50 other customers. They've been successful. They've had no problems. They've actually helped them save costs. They've helped them save you know, resources, they don't have to worry about working on things. They can actually deal with patients until they see that value or hear it from you. Um, it, it really becomes in a journey you have to take with them, you know, in order for you to prove it out to them. And through that journey, you build that relationship with them over time. And then the next time something comes up, they say, hey, go talk to Alfred. Those guys will help us out. So that's the trusted advisor relationship. You've got to build it over time. It doesn't happen overnight. You've got to show up and show up again and show up again and make sure you're always there to support them. And if you don't have the answer, you find somebody else that does and keep going. Yeah, I mean, look, there's perception and there's risk. These are big factors that are at play here. And a lot of organizations, they may have a perception about the company that you work for. And I said before, like I've worked for big companies, I've worked for small companies where I didn't have the benefit of a logo on my back. Um, and look, I've worked for big companies that sometimes customers still don't wanna talk to me. So how do you show up with value and what I've always tried to do is build a community around what I'm doing. So um, this could be, you know, trying to go out and find people that have engaged with us historically. Um, you know, fortunately, we also have some marketing insights and we can see who has engaged with us um, and go out there and invite them to something, you know, and send them, uh, you know, a newsletter, something that isn't trying to get a conversation or a meeting every time out of the gate, uh, but it avails them of some of the things that you want them to know about you and your brand. And then, like you said, being there, being available, um, you know, over time, if you make these types of investments and deposits into these relationships, you show up with value. Um, maybe you see an article that you think would resonate based on trends that you're seeing in their industry or press releases that you're seeing about this company. Um, you know, you see that M&A activity is happening in an organization and you have a, a bureau of your group that works very well in these types of scenarios. So, you know, offering these types of resources it's not always going to happen the first time. I mean, you want the planets to align, um, but it's a lot of deposits into these customer relationships that are ultimately going to yield that trusted advisor status, like you said. Um, and I think if, you, if you're intentional about building a community around what you're doing, you try to show up with unique value. Uh, we do a lot of webinars and events 
uh, web, you know, newsletters, things of that stature to engage, and then let them come to us on their terms, as opposed to just trying to say, hey, I'd love to talk to you about X, Y, Z. They don't care. They don't care what you'd love to do. They want to engage on their terms. So find the things that matter to them. Stay at the pulse of what matters to them. And you'll be part of the conversation. You'll be at the table when they're making some of these decisions. You've de-risked because you're present and you're investing in that relationship. Love it. I agree. I agree. Anything else? I know we've got like a minute left here. Anything else that you want to hit on? Anything else you want to chat about before we uh, sign off? Only thing I'm going to mention is you said the word deposits. You've got to make those commitment, those deposits over and over and over. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've worked with my, some of my key folks, even some that have left the company, they still reach out to me because we've made so many deposits and they know at the end of the day, if they need support, they can reach out to me. And that's part of building your brand as well. So powerful. It's it's so often that we think that there's a lot of things that are out of our control. And we struggle with the fact that maybe a customer feels like they're hamstrung right now. They can't work with us. Maybe their organization has made a decision to go elsewhere, even though they want to work with us. You never know where that executive is going to go. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen an executive go to another company. And guess what? I'm one of the first calls they make because of those deposits. Um, and I think that's where you can extend the value of your brand, like you said, um, but you can also you know, enhance the probability of your success just by making all these deposits. And just because it doesn't, you know, we live in this instant gratification society, exactly. so you're not going to see the result right away. You know, you're going to have to, you know, tend to the garden, but you never know when these things are going to sprout and bear fruit. And um, that's a that's a beautiful thing that you just hit on. Yeah. 